Hello everyone, I'm Al Rochelle. Thank you for joining us. In this segment, we're going to be talking about POTS and specifically how important is the OT in the phrase POTS and then how important is the S. It'll all make sense, I promise, in just a minute. Dr. Paolo Sandroni joins us right now from the Mayo Clinic. Up, I grew up in the Iowa-Minnesota border, so we know all about the Mayo Clinic. Tell me about your background and how you're involved with POTS in particular. I started working in uh, the autonomic field 30 years ago. And uh, this was the time when really we start to realize what POTS was. Mm -hmm. And we've been working on that since. And obviously I'm interested in any other disorder of the autonomic nervous system as probably already know and have been on staff and Mayo for over 20 years. Okay, for those who don't know, uh, what does POTS stand for? POTS stands for Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome. However, this was the original name we gave it. Then we realized that probably orthostatic was redundant. So the O became not in capital letter, so it became P, little O, and the T and the S remain caps. Okay. Having thought about that a little bit further, though, probably the O still should be in caps letter because postural for us in the autonomic field, we already understand that means that the patient has to be in a standing or changing from a more recumbent to sitting position and then standing. But literally speaking, postural could go the other way around. So sometimes I may have a patient that tells me that they get dizzy when they lay down. So that's a completely different situation. Oh, gosh. So it's, I think the O is still important. Right. So, so, so this, this is interesting about POTS and all of these dysautonomias. They get very, very complicated because you look at them one way and you expect this outcome. But then you look at another person and it's just the opposite outcome. So in a, in a clinical setting, how does that work trying to determine what is affecting that patient? Well, if it's a, for orthostatic intolerance, we really need the orthostatic component. So mm -hmm. the patient standing or could even be in very serious condition going from supine to sitting. Some patient can feel a headed and have blood pressure that drops. But for other patient, when the situation is the opposite, then we're dealing with completely different disorders that have nothing to do with the autonomic nervous system necessarily. Medicine is often a process of elimination, isn't it? Correct. <laughs> and, and that process can become very, very complicated. So tell me a little bit more about the clues that you would get from a clinical evaluation that would tell you in what direction you need to move. Well, when the patient tells me whenever I stand, if I do things too quickly, or even if I start exercising too intensely, I start to become lightheaded, I feel faint, and my heart races, that's a good clue that we're dealing with a disorder of reduced orthostatic tolerance mm -hmm. by definition. But I needed to make sure that there aren't other factors going on. If the patient has a vertiginous syndrome or there is some other medical condition, so that's really where the patient tedious work of elimination starts. And what tests do you actually give them to find this out? Is this the tilt table that we've talked about? The tilt table is the easiest. Tell me more about that. So. Essentially, we strap the patient to a table that can be tilted. You can do a poor man version in your office, having the patient lay down for a little bit, measure the pressure laying down, and then have the patient stand. But it's not quite the same, because if you stand in an active fashion, you have more muscle action. And so that test is less sensitive, while if the patient is strapped and doesn't do any movement, but we tilt at the table, that becomes more sensitive. Mm -hmm. And then we see that the pressure shouldn't drop in postural tachycardia syndrome, but the heart rate response is excessive and inappropriate. That's a key component. If I have a patient with orthostatic hypotension and they have compensatory tachycardia, that's an appropriate response. In mm -hmm. patient with POTS, there is no need for that excessive heart rate. Now, does everybody react same to that test so that you know it's a reliable test, per se? Should be, yes. Obviously, if I have a patient that took medication or if the patient is particularly dehydrated, mm -hmm. that will um, make the test less specific. But that's what we try to eliminate and we try to standardize it as much as so possible. So dehydration, why does that play a role in it? It's crucial because if I have a patient that's dehydrated, I will see that the blood pressure compresses a little bit. So the, when they stand, their, their systolic blood pressure will drop a little, while their diastolic blood pressure will rise some. And the patient will have a little bit of excessive tachycardia. may not be necessarily in a pathologic range, mm -hmm. but 
that can definitely be detected. Now talk to me about the, the role of salt. Water uh, dehydration and becoming hydrated, we kind of understand. What role does salt play in all of this? Salt is fundamental to allow the blood volume to expand. If I only put water in my system, chances are within a half hour is out of my system, the same way it came in. So in order to expand my blood volume, I need also salt mm -hmm. that will retain the water. It's interesting because when, for people that aren't dealing with these kind of diseases, when you'd say you'd need more salt in your diet, your brain kind of goes, wait a minute, I thought we were supposed to cut down on our salts, but in this, in this case. So uh, how is the salt delivered then to the body? Is it done intravenously or is it done through tablets? How? Wh how? Well, if you like salty food, that's the best way to get it, actually. R really? I mean, there are a lot of foods that contain a lot of salt. Uh -huh. And so some patients love it, some patients don't have a taste for salt. So in that case, the salt tablets are the easiest way to, to get it. Intravenous, it's a very difficult uh, discussion because it's valuable only if the patient is, let's say, has an intercurrent illness or whatever, and they cannot have an adequate oral intake. Mm -hmm. Intravenous is good for an acute event, but it's valid only for an hour or so. And then after that, again, the kidney will have taken care of it. So there is no point in giving IV periodically uh -huh. unless, again, there is an acute medical illness that will require that. Now, how much do doctors really know about r renal salt and handling and those kind of things? Is that, that's kind of one of these issues that seems to me it would be very specific to, to what you're doing, but also to dealing with people that deal with dysautonomias in general. I think it's pretty well known. Obviously, most people know that salt is bad, as you were just saying, because everyone knows, or yes, raises your blood pressure. But that's what we want in patients with dysautonomia, at least a little bit. Right. So, but it has to be done in a proper manner, because if you have too much salt, that causes a whole other set of problems. If you don't have enough salt, well, the blood pressure chances are is going to be low, your blood volume is going to be small. Water, water is good. Too much water, just free water, that's not good either. So because you've been working in this field for, for so long, have you seen changes in the way that it's being treated? I mean physically treated in terms of trying to do rehab or, or whatever needs to be done? I would say that more and more we are using less medication these days and more non-pharmacological strategies. So yes, the fluid, the salt, and the exercise is our holy trinity, literally. Right. And uh, you cannot just do one. You have to do all three. Right, and that takes discipline, doesn't it? So just a couple more questions. Uh, in terms of if the doctors that are watching us or healthcare professionals, give me a one-liner about what they should know about this interview that we're doing right now. What's the most important thing they should know? Keep in mind that the patient may present with a lot of different symptoms. Again, this is not a disorder. This is not a disease. It's a syndrome. Mm -hmm. And that's what we used to say this is a POTS package. So they may have gastrointestinal symptoms, brain fog, fatigue. Every patient will describe a little different, particularly if you have a young woman. And traditionally, we're talking thin people. They seem to be more susceptible oh, mm -hmm. to low blood mass. Yeah, yeah. If they are hypermobile, if they have lightheadedness, if they feel not up to par, check for this. Right, and that was the S that we had talked about when we started our program right here. Uh, l lastly, for patients that are watching this right now, because it's on a website and we're hoping that as an educational tool there'll be a lot of people watching this. What would you tell them, patients? Keep it up with the fluid and oral fluid and not IV. It's a big deal to have a central line. Lots of risk of trouble, infection, oh, yeah. blood clots, and doesn't provide any advantage. If, unless you're really hooked up daily and you keep infusing continuously, which is impossible. Right. So Drink plenty of fluid, get your salt, get your exercise, be patient, but we'll get there. Be pa we'll get there. That's a great message. Doctor, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it, and good luck as you do your continued research up at Mayo. Thank you, and thank you for having me.